Um, well, welcome. Here we are. Um, we're back to talk more about love. Uh, <laughs> and I'm glad you stuck with it this far. It's going to get really much worse today. <laughs> and <laughs> we're uh, we're going to have to talk a little bit about theology. Oh. And I've got Hegel in here. Oh. And... Uh, even much worse, I've got Marx and Engels in this lecture. Um, but there may be hope at the end for something exciting, because there's a couple popes that I'll throw. There's some pope references in here. So uh, uh, anyway, thank you for sticking with me so far. Um, so here we go. I never can seem to cover all the material I'd like to cover with you guys. Uh, so you, ha you have the, the slides in front of you. So. We may skip around, but you can go back and read some of this stuff in more detail if you'd like. Um, so here's what we've uh, done, <laughs> something like this. First off, we talked about different approaches to studying love, and we looked at some literature and art and poetry and religious sources, historical sources. Um, then we talked about puzzles, uh, especially sort of philosophical problems that you may not be interested in at all, but I find fascinating. <laughs> <laughs> um, we talked somewhere in there about psychology, and we had Freud um, and a couple of things like that. Then last time, we talked about ethics and family relationships. Um, and then today, the promise is to talk about religion. So I'm just going to bracket this right up front, because someone last time, I think it was you, said, eh. <laughs> we don't need it. We don't want it. Um, so, you know, throughout I'll have to try to persuade you that maybe the religious story is of interest, but at least it may be of interest because you might want to say, eh, we don't need it. <laughs> so if you're going to reject it, you need to sort of know what you're rejecting. So we'll kind of work that way through. I tell my students, you know, because sometimes, you know, philosophy classes, we look at all sides of the argument. And sometimes you actually spend more time trying to figure out the side you disagree with than the side you agree with, because then you can disagree with it intelligently. So uh, we'll work on that. Um, and something about wisdom, because deep at the heart of all of this is the claim that philosophy is a kind of love, love of wisdom, philosophia. So um, we'll see how this, how this unfolds. And again, stop me at any time, and we can chat. And if we don't get through all of this, eh. Um, we'll, we'll do our best. So uh, this morning, actually, I heard, or I, I came across it in the newspaper, the, the current pope, Pope Francis, was in Rome, and he said, basically, we should stop being so materialistic about Christmas, and instead we should focus on the reason for the season, as we say here in the United States, put the Christ back in Christmas, or however you want to put that. Um, so anyway, this was, uh, I, I went online and, and dug this up from the Catholic Herald, um, Pope Francis said, Mary, being conceived without sin, should give all Christians hope and strength in the daily battle that we must conduct against the threats of evil, because her immaculate conception is proof that evil does not have power over love. Hear the connection to our course. Uh, evil does not have power over love. In this struggle, we are not alone. We are not orphans, he said, because Jesus gave his mother to be our mother. Now, we're going to turn to this several times throughout today. This family relationships, very interesting. If we think about, you know, the root of the Western tradition, it talks about love. And in the mix, it's not just abstract, God is love, whatever that means, but this family drama of fathers and mothers and sons and so on. So we'll talk about that. Uh, continue. So uh, the Pope says, today we invoke her maternal protection on us, our families, this city, and the world. The Pope added, praying that God would free humanity from every spiritual and material slavery. In this time that leads up to the feast of Jesus' birth, teach us how to go against the current. Pope Francis prayed to Mary, teach people how to be unencumbered, to give ourselves, to listen, to be silent, to not focus on ourselves, but to leave space for the beauty of God, the source of true joy. So the, you know, the message is, that while there's Santa Claus and Grinches and shopping and Black Friday and all the rest of that, there's something else going on at this time of year. You're probably not surprised to hear that. 
are you really surprised that a pope would say that either? <laughs> so, I mean, some of this is just sort of stating the obvious. We could wonder, however, and this is actually the question for today, we could wonder, uh, you know, what's really going on with all of this uh, family story? Uh, is it really a family? How literally should we take this stuff? Um, and there's actually a big question. How does this really connect to what we do the rest of the time during the Christmas season, all the gift exchanging and Christmas trees and all that kind of stuff. So um, we'll, we'll come back to Pope Francis uh, at some point here in a few minutes, okay? Just sort of set the stage. Now, just to remind you what we've already talked about, uh, this, this, this tripartite scheme of love, eros, philia, and agape. Agape being the highest, most complete, broadest, deepest kind of love. So this points us in the religious direction and Certainly our tradition wants to say that there's a kind of developmental story that you move out of eros towards philia or friendship and then that culminates in this religious spreading, deepening love. Just to remind you about that. Also remind you, we talked about this previously, how our uh, relations from self to other are mediated through the ideas, right? So that structure, that way of understanding things about higher and lower loves, that helps us understand how we relate to one another. In the background also, by the way, is that family story that we celebrate at Christmas time, right? This idea of a father who loves the world and gives his son as a sacrifice and the receptive mother who receives God's gift and so on. All those ideas are percolating uh, when we're talking about our relations between one and the other. Then, just last bit of prelude here, um, we concluded last time with this passage. So uh, one reason I want to bring this back is just to remind you that we don't have to stay stuck in the Western uh, Christian Trinitarian story in order to get some of this. So Gandhi certainly uh, comes from a, a different point of view, but he kind of affirms the same story about the importance of love. Um, so let me, let me read this to you. We, we did this last time, but it's a nice passage to kind of set the stage. He says, It's my firm belief that it is love that sustains the earth. There only is life where there is love. Life without love is death. Love is the reverse of the coin of which the obverse is true. Uh, truth. Hatred ever kills. Love never dies. Such is the vast difference between the two. What is obtained by love is retained for all time. What is obtained by hatred proves a burden in reality, for it increases hatred. The duty of a human being is to diminish hatred and promote love. And we like to say, yay Gandhi, on that. <laughs> I think there's deep wisdom there. But of course, is it true? It's one of the things we have to wonder about. When he says, uh, what is obtained by love is retained for all time? That's a little poetic hyperbole, maybe. So, but notice in the mix here, is eternity, is immortality, is the lastingness, the endurance of love? Important ideas, and the poets talk about it, and of course the preachers do too. So here's Martin Luther King now jumping back over into uh, the Western Christian tradition. King, of course, learned quite a bit from Gandhi. Um, so it's not surprising you're going to hear echoes of Gandhi, but of course Gandhi also learned stuff from the Christian tradition. We talked a bit about that last time. Just kind of lifted some passages from King. King says, love is the only, the only creative, redemptive, transforming power in the universe. Love is, from that standpoint, love is the power of all powers. It's what moves things. It's the only creative, redeeming, transforming power in the universe. We could spend actually days thinking about that. What does that actually mean? We'll come back to that. He also, King also says, the moral arc of the universe is long, but it bends towards justice. You may have heard this one. Um, what King is suggesting is that in the long run, good triumphs over evil, love triumphs over hatred, and so on. Okay? He says, darkness cannot drive out darkness. Only light can do that. Hate cannot drive out hate. Only love can do that. And then, hatred paralyzes life. Love releases it. Hatred confuses life. Love harmonizes it. Hatred darkens life. Love illuminates it. 
Uh, do you get this? Love is a metaphysical power and principle. We started the, you know, what was that, a month ago, talked about love as the god Eros, right? The Greeks have this idea that love is a god. Notice all of this could be straight out of some kind of pagan mythology where love is in the room sprinkling stuff here and there to transform our lives. Of course, it's a little more abstract than that in Christianity. Or is it? Hmm. <laughs> Interesting question. And yet we, the humanists, want to say, what about this story? So, I mean, Gandhi and King, they're so hopeful and optimistic and naive, you could argue, <laughs> from a different perspective, right? So, I mean, if, if, you're, if you're Martin Luther King and, you, and you're seriously committed to the Christian story, there is redemption in the universe because Christ is born, right? That's the story. And yet, when modern science gets a hold of the world, what we see is a world that comes from nothing that's going nowhere. <laughs> that's it. Heat death is out there in our future. I mean, eventually the sun will expand, the earth will be consumed. Our astronomer friend in the front can fill in some of those details. Uh, I think there's a little dispute in cosmology about whether it may actually collapse upon itself again or whether it just might keep expanding and then dissipating, in which case, poof. <laughs> Where's love in all of that? Ah! Or, if you don't want to go with astronomy and cosmology, how about the evolutionary story, which basically says, you know, that something happened billions of years ago, DNA was formed, and DNA found a way to propagate itself, and that turned into sexual reproduction, where DNA could combine across individuals of the species, and that led to competition and sexual selection and so on. There's no love there. There's mating. There's reproducing, but there's no love. Uh, justice? The king says, moral arc of the universe bends towards justice. Is there justice in this natural scientific worldview? Yeah. Sometimes good people get run over by trucks. And sometimes evil people live long and prosperous lives. You're nodding. You've heard this story before. It doesn't really seem like justice is in control of things. Um, this indifference factor. We talked a little bit about maybe one opposite of love may be indifference. I mean, from a humanistic scientific standpoint, if you yell out to the universe, please! I mean, there's no, no, nothing comes back. There is no loving being in the universe that's going to give you what you want or what you need. That's, you know, here are the big alternatives now. So we've got Gandhi and King and Christian tradition on the one side, and then we've got a natural scientific worldview on the other side. It probably, my view on this, they probably cannot fit together. Some people have an idea where they want to say, well, they're kind of two, two sides of the same coin. I don't think so. <laughs> I think they're quite different. Um, now, this doesn't mean, by the way, that you can't find a meaningful existence from this standpoint. Um, but it does make things a bit harder. So, by the way, we had, I had Carl, Carl Sagan was there. <laughs> Moving on. So, uh, <laughs> um, we talked about Camus last time. Camus is one of the existentialists. Uh, very interesting sentence from this book, Myth of Sisyphus. He says, if man realized that the universe, like him, can love and suffer, he would be reconciled. Here's what he means by this. Life is hard, and then you die. And you just wish, you just hope, you have to believe, from a certain standpoint, that the universe recognizes your suffering, that the universe sees that your existence has value, that there is some embrace that the universe gives to you. If you could have that hope, Camus says, you would be reconciled. Meaning, you would be able to find life worth living. It would be worth it if we could believe that love was there. Right? Uh, notice the love and suffer bit. That's the two sides of Christianity, right? The Christmas story and the Easter story. Uh, suffering and love have to be together in there. Um, now, so actually, one, one pause on that. Camus thinks, is it true that the universe loves us and suffers with us? No, from Camus' standpoint, not true. It's a nice fantasy that the Christian tradition tells us, but it is not true. 
So Camus' solution is to try to find a way to make life worth living in that cosmic indifference, in the face of that cosmic indifference. One way that he suggests we do this is to learn to love other human beings. Now notice, you could say, well, you just gave up on a important stuff. Like, <laughs> God's love is up here and so powerful. And you, you lopped off the top, Camus, and now you just left us here alone. The adults have left the building, and now it's just the kids playing here, home alone. Uh, this idea of solidarity, though, that Camus talks about might be, might be a very powerful force for meaning in the universe, for meaning in life. How does this work for Camus? He says, when we see other people suffering and lacking in love, we can see that we need to give them something. So when we express love and ally ourselves in solidarity with suffering other people, now love happens. It's there. It's a spontaneous, creative gift of individuals. We give it to one another. And if we're going to find a way to make the world and make life meaningful, we've got to find a way to create that uh, horizontal or lateral love, love between human beings. But notice the divine story is gone with Camus. Uh, he uses this word, fecundity. It is love and fecundity or nothing at all. If we didn't have love, if we didn't have this human love, there would, really would be no reason to live. Fecundity means fertility. It, it, it gives birth to more. It generates things. It's creative. It causes things to happen. It builds in the world. Camus is saying we take God out of the building. We're still left with the possibility of building value in the world and creating things that mean something to ourselves and to one another. Yeah? Um, I, I find this to be uh, more meaningful to me than the concept that God is an intermediary in creating love. I, I've, I've been struggling with this the whole course. The idea that God is necessary for us to love. And I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm asking now. When we talk about agape love, it seems to me that Camus makes more sense to me than the Christian uh, uh, explanation. Yeah. And, and it, 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 one example, I love this course. Thank you. That's very nice. <laughs> but I have no, you know, there, there's, it's unconditioned. I love the people in this room for coming to this course and allowing me to talk and listen. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I don't see God. And, and I guess I've been struggling with this until, until right now. Well, no, it's very interesting, right? Uh, I mean, I, how I said, I don't think the two go together. It's an either or situation here. If we take God out, then this is what we got. And we could say, it's wonderful. And, and Yay. Traditionally, I'm not very loved. I accept that. I, I, I just, I accept you don't need God in the picture to, to make that happen. Yeah. Now, in response to Camus and you, Dale, uh, <laughs> a religious person may say, yeah, you're, you're playing around with it. You know, you're, you're skating on the surface of love but it's deeper and it's broader and it's wholer than any of this humanistic relation can be, right? Uh, notice, I mean, how would you know? <laughs> Which is the true story? Uh, how do you move from one to the other? Can't they both be meaningful, equally meaningful? It's an interesting and a difficult problem. Um, Camus very clearly says, you know, God left the building long ago and now it's up to us and it can be rich and rewarding. But religious people, including Martin Luther King and others, have said, no, 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 there's a much larger story that's even more powerful than that one. It's even more powerful than that one. My own opinion about this is, uh, you pick whichever story seems to work today. This may, <laughs> this may sound a little bit cheesy, but uh, you know, we philosophers always have to remember what we don't know and on any given day, I think I may know more than I'm entitled to claim. You know? so, and then tomorrow I go back and I revise it again, um, and the conversation goes on. You know? um, yeah. Isn't, well, isn't there something like a kind of a peace that you would have where he has arrived and is 
maybe not in tune with the other, and then someone else is the opposite. It's whatever is giving you the peace and comfort and understanding that it's all well with the world. Yeah. Well, I mean, okay. Very interesting. interesting. Uh, she, Roxy should suggest that this, would, however we got there, either Camus or religious story, it would make us feel that all was well with the world, right? Uh, kind of contentment, yeah. happiness, not at all. <laughs> so let me reiterate the story back to Camus. What he's saying is, when we see other people suffering, we are impelled to help them, which means we suffer with them. So you think about how love is really going to work in this scenario. The more you love, the more you hurt. The more you love, the more you're connected to other people and their suffering. I mean, he, Camus, I mean, he's, you know, comes through the resistance and he's an anti-colonialist and so on. I mean, he's, he's involved in, in motion against suffering, right? There is a kind of nice love story, nice love story, that says, we fall in love. And we listen to the violins and we float off on a canoe and it's happily ever after. Probably not for Camus, probably not also for the religious story, because if you know Martin Luther King's life, if you know his struggles, the kind of love that he hears, God commanding him, leads him to service and sacrifice. Right? Uh, in both cases, you might say, well, they're kind of fanatical about it. <laughs> they should cut it out. But the depth of love is that kind of motion, uh, that kind of suffering. Loving and suffering go hand in hand. Okay, so what we're going to do here is we're going to back up to the Greeks. We're going to work our way through Socrates. We're going to jump into Christianity. We're going to pop through the 19th century theologians. <laughs> and, and then we'll return to that exact problem. Um, <laughs> here's, the, here's the deal. How I think this has, has fleshed itself out. Fleshed itself out? That's a nice Christian metaphor. Fleshed itself out in the, in the Western tradition, which is that ethical love transforms itself somehow into a religious or metaphysical worldview. So Camus comes out the other end and says, no, we'll just stop with ethical. We won't go with the metaphysical approach. But the metaphysical idea has roots that go all the way back to the ancient Greeks. Uh, you know, you can sort of look at this, but let me direct your attention to this last uh, idea, which is that the things we love, we love them because they're good. And because they're good, we want to say about them that they endure. It could have a different story, which says that we love transient goods because of their transience. Did you hear how I said that? That would be kind of weird. It's not part of our tradition, really. There, I mean, you could probably find Heraclitus or some other people who suggest this. But this tradition seems to want to say that the things we love are lovable because they're so good, and since they're so good, we want them to endure. It's not, a, not much of a further step to say that the most good, the best thing in the universe, has to endure, is permanent eternal, immortal, everlasting, okay? The lovability, the loveworthiness of the beloved object seems to point towards eternity. True love lasts forever, you know? I mean, we have that in our, in our way of thinking about this from the poetic standpoint. Um, that's where the metaphysical story ends up. How does love work in, the, in this process? Well, we could say by loving things, we actually create value in those things. We give them value. We imbue them with value. You might also say we discover the value that's already there. So if you hear people talk about, you know, learning to see the, the inherent dignity and worth of persons, learning to see the spark of God within them or whatever. The attitude of loving, the loving disposition towards persons or things, creates value, stimulates value, sustains value, builds value, creates solidarity among valuable things, in a variety of other ways we could put that. Just think about how powerful love is in that sense, right? What does love create? It creates families. That's kind of cool, and it's a metaphysical moment, right? Where there were, where's no family, what's that song, that Danny song came to mind, you know, uh, 
I may not know, er, never, skip the song because I can't sing it. Uh, it's a Kenny Loggins song. Anyway, where once there was none, now there is one. Now, you know, from no family, suddenly there is a family, right? Across the gap between two persons, something happens and now there's more than just the two of us. It creates, it sustains. And then there's this great idea that love will endure even beyond and after this life. What a beautiful idea, right? Towards permanence. Okay, how do we get there? This is El, uh, Alcibiades being led by Socrates away from the sensual life. So there's a story, uh, it's in the symposium. I gave you the, the picture, picture book version of the symposium earlier. Two beings divided in two, and then they try to come back together and so on. In the heart of the symposium, this guy Alcibiades, oops, got my wrong button here. This guy Alcibiades bursts into the room and he wants to have sex with Socrates. <clears throat> okay. Uh, and Socrates says, hey, wait a minute, you misunderstood me. <laughs> I am your teacher and I love you, but I don't want to have sex with you. Instead, what I want to do, Socrates says, is lead you away from the body towards the good itself. To lead you away from beautiful bodies towards the beautiful itself. To lead you away from the sensual world toward the wo world of enduring, permanent ideas. If you know anything about Plato and his theory of ideas, this should make perfect sense to you. Alcibiades, who comes in, and there's a very weird thing. He sits next to Socrates on the couch, and like he's stroking his leg. Oh, Socrates, you're so awesome, you know. And Socrates keeps <laughs> slapping the leg away. <laughs> uh, Alcibiades has misunderstood what love is all about. He thinks it's directed towards this world of transient things, the sensual side of things, the erotic or eros. Socrates says, no, 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 there's something else. We work our way through love of bodies towards love of the good itself. It's an upward path, okay? Um, and in this dialogue, Socrates describes philosophy itself as a kind of midwifery. It's a nice word, midwifery. Uh, sounds very kind of medieval, midwifery. Um, <laughs> how it's supposed to work, Socrates says, the philosopher, the teacher in general, helps students give birth to good things. The philosopher doesn't do anything. He facilitates. He allows the goodness within the person or within the object, he allows the goodness to, to come forth. He allows it to blossom. He allows us to give birth to virtue, wisdom, beauty, truth, justice, and so on. The philosopher is midwife. Now, what's very interesting in the heart of this story, did I talk about this with you before? I don't think so. No. Diotima? No. Diotima. Oh, I, I'm sorry we haven't gotten there yet, but let's go with Diotima. At the heart of Plato's work, the symposium, it's all these men, and there's a little homosexual overtone to some of it, and Socrates tells a story about how he learned about philosophy. And his story is that he learned it from a woman, from a foreign, exotic woman named Diotima, who herself was a midwife, who explains to him exactly how this midwifery approach to education and wisdom works. Uh, so no, notice the little clever gender move here. At the heart of this male-dominant tradition, <laughs> there's a woman's voice whispering in the background who basically says that it's all about love, that love is a God who connects us from the world of sensual reality to the world of ultimate truth, that love is the powerful force in the universe that transforms us and lifts us out of ourselves towards something better, more beautiful, more virtuous. It's nice that it's a woman's voice, I think. Um, she, she says about... Uh, they're, they're using a little bit of Greek theological language. She says about the God, love, that he is an intermediate. He's an intermediate between the divine and the mortal. What connects human beings to God is love. Doesn't this sound kind of Christian from a certain standpoint? Um, she says 
that the power of the God love is to be a mediator. So, and she lists this stuff, prophecy, sacrifice, mysterious, incantation. When mystical religious magic happens, that's love. That's the presence of love in the world, working back and forth between man and God, uh, helping us to give birth to, to that larger, more divine thing. She says about uh, love that what lovers ultimately love is wisdom. Let me read this one to you. They, uh, who then are the lovers of wisdom? They are those who are in a mean between the two. Love is one of them, for wisdom is a most beautiful thing, and love is of the beautiful, and therefore love is also a philosopher or lover of wisdom, and being a lover of wisdom is in a mean between the wise and the ignorant. What does that mean? Good luck. <laughs> Here's what I think she's getting at here, or what Plato's getting at, is that there are humans... And there are gods. Somehow, some humans can find their way beyond their humanity towards some connection with the unchanging, with the true, with the just, with the good, with the beautiful. And when we make that move, we are more than human, but not quite God. We're in the middle. And it's love that lifts us from our humanity towards these other things. Does that make any sense? It goes like this. If you don't quite understand, like what you're, some of you are going, huh? <laughs> Let's pause for a minute. Uh, if you love anything, a craft, uh, creating art, writing, scrapbooking, whatever it is, what happens is you devote your energy, your time, your passion, your skills, your wisdom to that thing. And the more you love it, the more you want to learn about it and perfect it and build it up and basically give birth to the thing, right? So somehow, whenever that happens, whenever we move beyond our mere animality through development, through education and so on, we are becoming more godlike, and that process is facilitated by love. Hmm. You're not buying that one either. Okay. So <laughs> what is it we're actually aiming at through all of this? So whatever our particular love is, it's mathematics, say. It's science, say. What are we aiming at? We're aiming at the most beautiful, most enduring, most true, most just, most perfect of all things. Wisdom. What? Wisdom. Wisdom. Yes. We're aiming through our concrete particular loves, including sensual love for other human beings, we're aiming beyond all that towards something that is absolutely worthy of love that will endure, that's permanent, perfect, the beautiful thing itself, whatever that is. You know, you're scratching through your math problems, and da, da, da. you're looking for the perfect equation. You probably didn't know that. <laughs> you're scrapbooking, you're putting stuff, you're looking for the perfect scrapbook. You know, <laughs> our desire for perfection is part of this, and ultimately, where we aim at is towards the immortal between man and God, between humanity and mortality and immortality. Love is that upward path and upward journey. And Socrates says this, and he tells us he learned it from a woman. Let's bring in the family uh, story, right? Those of you who have children and grandchildren, you look at them and you think, oh man, I'm so lucky that those people will endure after me, you know? There is this kind of forward motion in the universe, and I'm glad to have been part of it, to see them moving on their own path towards their own kind of perfection. Right? You see the beauty in them when it's not even there. You have this great hope and this great passion that they will develop into the perfect thing. Right? Clearly much better than you. <laughs> and hope and hope for the next generation and so on. That's a kind of love of immortality too. Right? To see yourself projected in the world. It's the mother's love of the child. It's the father's love of the child, and so on. You believe it? <laughs> you buying this? So then there's this interesting claim. Socrates had it there. Plato had it that love conquers death because it aims towards the enduring and the immortal. If we can get out of this finite mess through love, somehow we'll connect to the thing that endures and that lasts. 
Again, you could go religious on this, you'll connect with God, right? Or maybe you go non-religious, that you'll connect to humanity. You know, that the world will be better because you existed. You embody your love in the world, and you have this hope that the world will be changed. That something will endure beyond you. This, you, you may have seen this phrase, love conquers all, right? The idea that love is the most powerful thing, um, and that it can even conquer death. Done with the Greeks? How about the Christians? <laughs> so you may have seen at a baseball game or a football game, people hang this John 3.16. In case you didn't know, here's what it says. Uh, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Notice the family story, the love bit, and the eternal life bit. It may be probably the case that the gospel writers knew a little bit about Plato. <laughs> knew a little bit about Greek philosophy. Uh, in fact, there's a story here about the sources that I had some earlier slides. I deleted them because it gets really boring very quickly. Uh, but if you're interested in biblical history and biblical exegesis, there's a story even about the chronology of the writing of the Gospels. You may have heard this one, the, the source hypothesis that says that Mark was the earliest. And then probably a generation later, there was this Q document that is probably a source for Luke and Matthew. Luke seems to be the more uh, educated in terms of Greek ideas. And then much later comes John, maybe even up to 100 years later, the Gospel of John is written. And John seems to be the more philosophical of the texts, um, probably influenced by Greek philosophy. <clears throat> anyway, see the connection here. Family drama, love, eternal life, and of course, religion. So then this gets fleshed out in the letter of John. I'm not going to read all of this to you, but the, the important phrase, for God is love. He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. In this, the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent his only Son into the world so that we might live through him. And this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be the expiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. Are you surprised to see this one? <laughs> In this context, God is love. That's the claim. The family drama gets literally fleshed out, right? So the abstract God, fatherly love, gets embodied through the, the work of Mary into this son who is born that gives us love, that makes love possible, that then promises eternal life. Okay? And Camus says, nah. <laughs> Carl Sagan, uh-uh. <laughs> um, so now let's build up the Christian story a bit. You may already know this one and just be like, okay, can we keep moving? But uh, some of you may not uh, be all that familiar with some of these ideas. Um, and there's a variety of places we could dig and find this. I, I'm, I'm moving into the 19th century here with uh, Dostoevsky and the brothers Karamazov because in a moment I'm going to present the counter argument against this. Okay? Oh, -ho! God hates us. No, I'm not, it's not going to be like that. But um, anyway. <laughs> uh, that would be the Gnostics. You know about the Gnostics who thought that this God in this life was a bad and evil God, and there's a God beyond this story. We won't go there. Okay. Uh, Brothers Karamazov, Dostoevsky, 19th century. This character, Father Zosima, who is the, the kind of uh, Russian Orthodox sage monk. This, the, any, a few of you read this book, Brothers Karamazov? Alyosha, the young man, goes and learns from Father Zosima, and then there's a couple other brothers, including Ivan, and Ivan is the atheist humanist, and we'll turn to his argument in just a second. Father Zosima says, and it sounds a bit like Gandhi, uh, he says, you should learn to love everything. If you can learn to love everything, then you'll get it, right? Love everything, love every leaf, every ray of God's light, love the animals, love the plants, love everything. If you love everything, you will perceive the divine mystery in things. Once you have perceived it, you will begin to comprehend it better every day, and you will come at last to love the world with an all-embracing love. What I like about, what I love about this <laughs> is, I mean, it, it's everything. I mean, it's leaves and animals and plants and rays of sunshine and rain. Loving everything. Imagine if you could get in that attitude, that demeanor, that disposition to love everything. 
Wouldn't that be great? Right? To have the all-embracing love. And he seems to suggest the more powerful your loving connection to the world, the more you will feel love. Right? Because when you give love, it redounds upon you, rebounds upon you somehow. Ah, nice Father Zosima. <laughs> uh, following up on the gospel accounts and so on. Um, but he's just talking about wonderful good things, leaves and flowers and graves. He's not talking about evil and killing and are we supposed to love that too? <laughs> you hear what she says, but what about the crap in the world? We're supposed to love that too? Love a man even in his sin. Love your enemies. Love those who hate you. Right? Yeah, it's supposed to extend to malaria and child cancer and diarrhea. <laughs> love it all. <laughs> now, <laughs> Is it possible? There's two, I mean, two questions, several questions, but one, is it possible really to do this? Second question, is it a good idea? Seems like some things we should hate, like our enemies. <laughs> and yet very clearly there is that command, love your enemies. What do you think? You don't have to hate, because I think that's destructive. But for self-preservation, you can't love everything. You have to have some care about. Yeah, some judgment. Some judgment. Be judicious in your love. Yeah. Yeah. Some wisdom, <laughs> moderation in love. <laughs> this is interesting, right? To be judicious and moderate and temperate in your loving. But love itself is supposed to be obsessive and all-consuming and all-pervasive and all-embracing. This is tricky. The humanists will say, cut it out. You know, yeah, but there's some bad stuff and there are bad people and we don't love them. The end. <laughs> and life's okay that way. But Father Zosima says, no, you have to go beyond that judicious love, that self-reserved love, that self-preserving love, and move over into self-sacrificing, self-denying, self-abnegating love. Yeah. Ah, yes. Where do you, what is the bottom line to go with that? And looking at it through a different language, how does it apply? Yeah. It's too ethereal to name. It, I mean, this, yes, thank you. <laughs> this is where we started, and we're going we're gonna to keep circling back to this. Uh, what are you talking about, love everything? How is that even possible? When I love my wife, it's one thing. And when I love my children, it's different. And when I love this class, even different. And malaria? You know, that's even different. Uh, this seems to be so vague as to be meaningless, nonsensical. You're, you said ethereal. You're floating off into the mists, Father Zosima. And he would say, no, I'm getting in touch with reality. I'm seeing the world that God created because God created a world that's worthy of love, even the nasty stuff. God created it after all. It's there for us to love. It may be difficult. It may not be smart. But there's something more than being smart in the world. There's something more than being self-interested and preserving yourself. Christianity seems to have that. Um, just to show you a further connection here, I'm going to return to him towards the end here. Paul Tillich is a 20th century theologian. Um, he's probably, in my estimation, probably the most important theologian in the 20th century. Um, he, he very clearly says love is stronger than death. Uh, and what he means by this, I think, <laughs> I was talking with a colleague earlier today. We don't re we're not really sure what this means, but uh, <laughs> we were talking about it for a good half an hour. Um, it's something like this, that love is that enduring, sustaining power that bridges the gap, that mediates between all the differences and all the different parts in the world, that even gives value to things that don't have it. 
right? I mean, you could learn, you could choose to love something and give love to things that seem to completely lack any worth, but by loving them, it provides them with a kind of value and color, right? Uh, he says, and it sounds a bit like Camus, love is stronger, it creates something new out of destruction caused by death. It bears everything and overcomes everything. It is at work where the power of death is strongest in war and persecution and homelessness and hunger and physical death itself. It rescues life from death. It rescues each of us for love is stronger than death. In the face of death and destruction and war and misery, the only way to fix it, the only way to create value in it is to find love in it. Hmm. But, come on. <laughs> Let's get serious. So Ivan Karamazov, uh, the atheist humanist in the Brothers Karamazov, um, he says about this, more or less, bullshit. <laughs> to be frank. <laughs> all this flower, you said it already, all this flowery language about love and so on, that's not going to help anyone. You know, and he lists the horrors. You go and read this section of the book, and it, I mean, it's terrible things, including the one that seems to bother him among the many. Well, I could list them for you. Uh, children, that, babies that are thrown into the air and caught on bayonets. Knives and sabers that are used to rip infants out of mother's wombs. This happens in, this, in our world. And one that, he, that he, he describes, whipping a horse in its eyes. <sighs> Some, when I, I've talked about this with students. The horse in the eye thing seems to be like cringeworthy, even when the infant one isn't for students. I don't know what that is all about. But anyway, he says, uh, Yvonne says about this, you can talk till you're blue in the face about love, but those babies are dead and that horse has suffered. All this love nonsense does not bring that baby back to life. Even if, Yvonne says, even if there is immortal life, even if there is resurrection of the dead, that baby still suffered those moments of terror and hatred and pain and cruelty. That cannot ever be washed away, even by love, he says. It's a profound and dark insight. He says about that, therefore, he rejects the whole story. So Father Zosima and all of your nonsense about love, how does that help us in a world of genocide and concentration camps and child rape and so on? Yvonne says, I don't want to have anything to do with that story. A different way he puts it, I, I tear up my ticket. I'm not going. <laughs> I'm not playing your game. Hmm. Yeah. I'm looking at love in a, and I guess in, in a more cosmic context and wondering if part of that loving everything is really, and I'll just speak for myself, that I don't like all those things that you just mentioned, but I can accept that there are those things in the world and there are also those things in the world in terms that I don't, I'm not aware of, that, that, that the balance, I guess like my cosmology says there's a balance that's maybe seeking harmony in yeah. the whole. But man has free will. <clears throat> that's a gift. And if he uses it for something that I don't particularly like, I can love that person, but I don't have to love what he does. Yeah. And I don't have to seek to perpetuate it. I don't have to sanction it. But I can love the whole and say, okay, there are these things that I cannot fathom, and I can accept that and still love, love the person, love the world, and understand there is evil and there are the dislike, and that's a judgment. Do you see what I mean? Yeah, yeah. There's something bigger that I don't, that's part of the mystery, and... I can accept that there are those things that I don't like them and I choose to try to eradicate them, but that's my free choice. Yeah, too. yeah. And that person, that, that, that rapist has his free choice and, you know, I can still see the divine and I don't sanction what he does, but I know that there is, within each of us, this is my own cosmology, a spark of the divine and if I don't choose to make contact with it, 
That's my fault. That's yeah. Fault. No, you, yeah, no, you're, 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 he, you're hitting on all of the, the traditional responses to this exact problem. One is the free will response, right? That uh, we're created with free will, which means, unfortunately, some evil will happen because people are given the, the freedom to choose. Uh, everything seems to happen for a reason from that point of view, right? That in the long run, it will all be reconciled. There's some meaning even to disfigurement and death and rape and misery and murder and all the rest of that. There's some higher purpose, right? Now notice the dividing line here. Uh, some will go with you or Father Zosima or Martin Luther King and say, yeah, we believe it. We accept the fact that this is the best universe created by a loving God, right? Uh, the whole story, the Christian story, we just accept it as a matter of faith or something. I'm not saying that's exactly where you're going with this. Yvonne will say, no, not going to buy it. <laughs> because every time you say it'll be reconciled down the line, I hear the screaming of those babies. You know, Every time you say free will, I see idiots that should be killed and locked away. <laughs> you know? Uh, it's a, it's a, I think it's a, a profound dividing line in how we looked at the universe. You know, either it, there is some loving, meaningful, just power in the world or not. Now back to Camus briefly on this. I mean, this is, we're getting deep here, <laughs> right? But Camus would say, if we go on the dividing line with Ivan Karamazov, now we have an obligation to create love in the universe by preventing those babies from being tortured. Right? There's a positive uh, obligation of justice and solidarity. But on Camus' story, there's no guarantee it's going to work. One genocide ends and another one happens. All we can do is keep working to prevent. But the universe is dark and bleak and heat death is out there. <laughs> right? Martin Luther King, on the other side, right? same kind of effort, and inspiration to change the world, but with the faith that it will work somewhere in the long run. Right? Now, you know, some will say, well, that's why you should go with King, because it's more, more optimistic or hopeful. But Karamazov and Camus would say, no, we don't need false hope. <laughs> we need realistic remedies in the real world. Yeah. I have trouble with, uh, we've been talking about love, and I have trouble with it by the fact that I see the opposite of love is indifference. And if you read not to be indifferent to the whole world as love, then it's fine to me to not be indifferent. Yeah. Then you love everything, but you're not indifferent to it. Yeah, yeah. So you're, I even mean, hear you may be saying that, that people that actively hate things are a little bit better off than the indifferent. <laughs> Because at least you're engaged and paying attention. <laughs> it, may, it might be. It might be. The difference is very, very strong. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I yeah. Just, I, I've seen that as part of the problem when we talk about love and hate. The indifference to me is the strongest thing. That's stronger than hate. Yeah. Yeah, it could, it could be. Uh, I mean, we're, we'd have to, you have to pull this apart in, in a variety of ways, right? Um, I think this argument, the problem of evil, evil argument, is saying that if there is a God, he's indifferent to suffering. Uh, no, the, you push the problem of evil argument, it gets fleshed out like this, that if God were loving, he would create a better world where this crap wouldn't happen. So it seems like God, if there is one, has just turned his back to creation and is not doing what a loving God should do. Now, a different story would say, <laughs> there is evil, and God wants it to happen because he hates us so much. <laughs> that would be, that's a dark and sinister picture of the universe. Um, yes? Well, we, we've talked about uh, man having free will, and that explains a lot of evil in the world, but how about something like cancer? Uh, man has nothing to do with that. How about uh, who created cancer? How about polio? And Earthquakes and hurricanes and... Right, should we yeah. hate uh, salt because he helped get rid of uh, polio? <laughs> yeah, well, this, I mean, this has to, you have to pull... 
I once taught an article on this that uh, I gave to my undergraduate students. It has a uh, premise and conclusion that's like 350 steps. We have to get really complicated here to think about it. But there is a difference between human evil and, in quote now, the evils of the natural world, right? We want to say with human evil, it's intended. What makes it evil, I mean, when the soldier cuts the mother's womb open, he knows what he's doing, he intends the harm that he causes. That seems to be evil in a radical, profound, moral sense. Hurricanes don't work that way. Uh, viruses and tumors don't work that way, right? Uh, and yet, you could sort of lump those together and say, well, God shouldn't have created any of that junk if he loved us. <laughs> um, yeah, you had your hand up, and then we can move on. Okay. It's in the universe. Um, <laughs> uh, I'm going to skip this. Let me just say briefly. Yvonne also thinks there's really no good reason to love other people. Well, it's a little bit more complicated than that. He says, what, he's, what he suggests is about the golden rule, it's very easy to say, I love my neighbor. But you, eh. You know, I love my neighbor, but uh uh, you know. Uh, <laughs> he, he's pointing out how difficult it would be to actually have Christ like Father Zosima like love. Because it would require you to actually love the concrete person that everyone is. And that's impossible from his standpoint. Which means, therefore, it's a stupid idea. <laughs> Why would anyone command neighbor love when we can't do it? It seems to be impossible. And uh, not smart. One of you pointed this out. Maybe, maybe problematic. Okay. Um, wow. I'm sorry if I'm boring you so far. Um, we have uh, we have about a half an hour to go, and I haven't even gotten to Christmas yet. Um, <laughs> uh, hmm. I'm not indifferent at all. Um, here's a story about God. This is my favorite philosopher, Hegel. Um, Hegel says, he's wondering, oh, hey, well, let's start at the beginning. Why is there something rather than nothing? That's the beginning. I mean, literally, that is. <laughs> why, is why does anything exist? This is the biggest question of metaphysics. Why are we here? What is this? And why is it here? Ah. Um, <laughs> Hegel gives a story about this. He's not the only one, but his is fairly well known and kind of schematized in this way. There is a being. Let's call him God. God wants to understand himself. In order to understand himself, he has to project himself outside of himself. Then he can see himself and recognize himself and know himself. That's it. What is history and the universe about? It is the self-othering of God and the return to self through recognition in otherness. Did that sound complicated? <laughs> let me make it, let me, let's, we'll, we'll turn this into the Christian story, okay? So in the beginning, I mean, what was God doing in the beginning? Yeah, why did he create the heaven and the earth? What? He was bored. He was lonely. He loved, but he had nothing to love. Here we turn this into a love story, right? There was, uh, there was nothing to love because it was God and the nothing, right? God's self-love generates itself into the world, creates a world, and what does he say after each day? It's good. It's worthy of his love, you know? Seven days go by, there's a Sabbath in there, there's some humans and so on, and the humans screw it up. <laughs> then there's a couple of destructive events and floods and blah, blah, blah. Okay, so then, but notice God has projected himself into the world to find a partner, to find some object worthy of love, to understand himself because he's projecting himself into the world in this way, or to stay in the family story, the father begets the son. Right? Now, in the Son, the Father sees himself somehow. Right? Learns to love himself by seeing the other that he has become. Is this getting complicated? Okay, then what is supposed to happen at the end? Well, the created being has to return to the creator 
How? By love. So what are the two commandments in the Christian story? Love God and love your neighbor as yourself. Love God, yeah, that's the return. Love your neighbor as yourself, why? Because God created the neighbor, and the neighbor is a projection of God, so when we love the neighbor, we also love God. And through that whole process, from the Hegelian story, through that whole process, God is learning about himself, is loving himself, is exploring his own nature. You like that? No. <laughs> too abstract. Too boring. Yeah. Has there ever addressed the question of where did God from come from? Do you have an answer? She says, where does God come from? No, I'm just saying, has any philosopher ever addressed that? Of, you've got God, but where did God come from? Yes, well. God, and what was there before God? And who come out of the paper? Has anybody addressed that? Two possibilities. <laughs> Only two. <laughs> Either God was created by some other being, in which case we've got another question. Where did that other being come from? <laughs> Two possibilities. <laughs> that being was created by, you know, that's the infinite regress path, known as the infinite regress from one to the other. I mean, where does it stop? No one knows. And some say that infinite regresses are absurd, not permissible, uh, will get us nowhere. So the other answer is God is a self-created being. No. <laughs> God is all being, everything. Not out of nothing, but the all. Mm. Infinite regress. We go all the way back, you know. I mean, it's, I mean it gets, I mean, uh, where does it all get started? This gets quite problematic. With the universe, I mean, not only God, but, I mean, astronomy, you know, but the universe, but, and the Big Bang Theory, but yeah, it's a, oh, these are huge, important questions. Gen generally, though, the story is either infinite regress, in which case we don't have an answer, or we need a place to stop. And we stop with the being who is a self-causing being, right? The prime mover, the cause of all, being itself. Different way of putting it. Paul Tillich says, the ground of being. The ground of being? The, the being of all beings. You permit that, it gets really fuzzy. Because then you say, what the hell are you talking about? Being has to come from somewhere. There has to be a cause of the thing. Yeah, and so it goes. Um, why, why Hegel's story is interesting from this, with regard to this question is it's not about where did God come from. It's about what is God. So let's imagine we bracket that causal question. So what is God? Hegel wants to say that God is like the self. And the self is not content to remain alone. The self is always looking for another self. It's all, remember Master Slave? We did that a little while ago. Right? The self is looking to be recognized. The self is looking to find a partner, to find itself in the world, or at least to look in a mirror. You know? So the nature of God on this story is creative, energetic. It's potentiality being actualized or to go back to really the topic for this class, it's love. The nature of God is to love. And the loving God wants to create an object that's worthy of love. Well, where'd that come from? <laughs> yeah. Just, just think of the assumptions that we've had to make to listen to you for the last five minutes. Just, just, just for a minute. <laughs> when you start out that Hegelian theory, you always start the word he. Now that's an assumption. <laughs> That's a big assumption about God. Uh, we all, we, we, in the Christian tradition, we, we talk about God. What about gods? I mean, for most of human history, there's been more than one. And as my friend here in the front says, and, and who made God human? How do we know God has human form? How do we know all of this is not transpiring from us to create him rather than him to create us? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> you knew it was coming, I guess. Um, <laughs> I saw there was another hand, but if, if you don't mind, I'm going to keep moving on this. We've got to get to Christmas here in a minute. Um, uh, so Hegel had that story, and people raised these kind of objections, said, oh, wait a minute. Oh. Um, one of Hegel's students, Ludwig Feuerbach, nice German name, comes along 
and says, look, Hegel, you got it backwards. The idea of God comes from the human somehow. The humans, I, it's not quite my slide, I'm going to get to the next one in a minute. Uh, when humans try to understand what God is and where God comes from, they project all of these anthropomorphic things onto God, including this idea that God is a loving God. Now imagine the story we... I get all excited. I'm jump, jump in. <laughs> imagine the story we tell about God, which is that God loves who? Us. Did you ever really think about that? I mean, maybe God is more like the God of the dogs, and we're just in the way. You know, but the story we tell is an anthropocentric story. We say that God loves us. So Feuerbach suggests that the whole story is all about us and not at all about God. He doesn't, doesn't really take God out yet, uh, but he returns us to anthropology. Anthropos, study of human being. So he says this, love determined God to the renunciation of his divinity. Thus, love is a higher power and truth than deity. Love conquers God. What sort of love? Love of man. The Christian story on Feuerbach's interpretation, the title of this book is The Essence of Christianity. The Christian story on Feuerbach's interpretation is that God loves us so much, he becomes one of us. And he renounces his divinity, which tells us that who's, who's the real God? The human has now elevated itself above the God. So here's the reversal. Now with Feuerbach, we're just left with human beings and God sort of dissipates. So all of the religious language, Feuerbach says on this interpretation, all of the religious story is just our self-congratulatory, yay for us! <laughs> Love your neighbor as yourself. Why? Because your neighbor is created in the image of God. What a friendly coincidence that your neighbor is created in the image of God. We become gods, you know? Uh, so he says, God is God has not saved us, but love, which transcends the difference between, this should be divine, <laughs> the difference between, <laughs> between divine and human personality, as God has renounced himself out of love. I was typing fast, you can see. <laughs> so we, out of love, should renounce God. For if we do not sacrifice God to love, we sacrifice love to God. Now, this is a profound statement. Let me explain this. He's saying that we, what he's talking about is fanaticism based on religion. Divisive religion. Images of God that turn God into an anti-human God. He says love conquers God, which means that now love is the rule in the universe. And any kind of fanatical old-fashioned religion that tells us that we should kill in the name of God has to be eliminated. We've got to sacrifice the old story about God to, yeah, we've got to sacrifice the old story about God in the name of love. Why? Because it's about humans, not about God anymore. Did you know that you were going this way in your question here? <laughs> it, I mean, it may not be quite what you had in mind, but this is a profound moment, middle of the 19th century, uh, the name for this move is the humanistic move, right? So we, this can be described as Christian humanism. And there are a variety of thinkers, including some of those Christian existentialists like Kierkegaard and Gabriel Marcel and some of the other folks we talked about who would agree with this. Now, just to, sh to continue the little bit of history lesson in the 19th century, Feuerbach says this. He, Feuerbach basically says that... Uh, what matters is the material world of human beings, not abstract theology and all that religious stuff. Marx, Karl Marx, a contemporary more or less of Feuerbach and Friedrich Engels, his partner, say, Feuerbach, good idea. Why do you still keep talking so much about God? They say, let's, let's turn Feuerbach into real practical philosophy. So they, they both write in different ways about Feuerbach, but say what has to happen next is love has to become real. So Feuerbach reminded us the importance of love, the human focus. Now the job is to change the human world to make it more humane and more worthy of love, right? To embody love in the world. Now, you may have heard of these guys. They have a particular idea what this is supposed to look like, <laughs> right? Communism. 
they claim that communism is basically the practical outcome of Western theology based on this story about love. Did you know that? Bizarre if you really think about it. Uh, so uh, very famous uh, work by Karl Marx uh, when he's fairly young called The Theses on Feuerbach and the 11th Thesis. So these are, this is him kind of riffing on Feuerbach, what he learned from Feuerbach. He says, what I learned from Feuerbach is now we give up on God and we focus on man. And now the goal is philosophers have to stop talking theology and start doing social, political philosophy, ethics, and political action. The goal now is to change the world, to make love come true by totalitarian systems of government that, uh, no, I'm kidding about that part. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> okay, let's, let's push this forward into the 21st century, <clears throat> and then we'll turn to Christmas. This is a, a guy down at Claremont, uh, Claremont College, is at Pitzer College. I was just down there a few weeks ago, and I went to a conference that he hosted. On The, the title of the conference was Secularism and Non-Religion. Um, he is... Uh, a, a prominent humanist, a defender of secular approaches to the world, humanistic approaches to the world. He just published this book, and I'm just helping to blurb his book for uh, Living the Secular Life, where he argues that it is entirely possible to live a happy, contented, loving life without the religious story in there. So those of you who are interested, you might want to take it. It's fresh off the, the, the presses. I mean, it's literally published within the last few weeks. Um, what he explains is, you can be loving and good and altruistic without the God story. Okay? Uh, you hear how that just follows from what, you know, Hegel to Feuerbach to Marx to now we get 21st century humanism. Of course, now let's pause. Instead of triumphantly saying yay for humanism, Pope Francis, to remind you, we started the, this hour with Francis, he says, wait a minute. Our culture has become too humanistic. It's become materialistic. It's become consumeristic. It's become individualistic. It's become uncaring. It's become focused on trivia and certainly unloving. So it may be, from the religious standpoint, from the Martin Luther King, from the Pope Francis standpoint, it may be that this guy, you know, he can say this until he's blue in the face, but it doesn't make it true that secular humanist culture is loving and kind and generous and altruistic. It may be that secular culture turns Christmas into consumerism, you know, which is one of the objections. Yeah. Yeah, I, I'm glad you got to this point because I see love as being active. You can love all you want unless you show that love. It means nothing as far as I'm concerned. I take... Um, because I've worked with them in the past, I think in terms of the homeless. The homeless are fed and sheltered and helped in a caring way because of religion. It's all churches that are doing it. There's no secular yeah. thing other than the government, which gives maybe 5%. 95% come from churches. And I'm not a religious person, so it isn't because I'm in favor of churches. It's because they are showing the act of, I don't see, um, and there again, I'm not um, talking against atheists or agnostics or anything like that, but where are they showing love to people like that? Yeah. Loving the unlovable is love. <clears throat> no, it's a, it's a wonderful question, right? So uh, one possible answer, you gave a hint about it. In case you didn't hear, she says, uh, religious organizations and people do a lot of the active loving in the world by reaching out and service and taking care of people, taking care of even those who seem not to be worthy of love, right? This kind of absolute giving from religious organizations. You said, though, the secular folks may do it through the government. 
So this is actually Phil Zuckerman's, one of his ideas about this. He was here actually a year, a year or two ago. Maybe some of you came and saw when he talked. Uh, he, his argument is that secular systems, political systems, do a good job of taking care of the homeless, the weak, the sick, and so on. I mean, to make it a little concrete and a bit cheesy, it's Obamacare. <laughs> you know, it's through government action that love happens in, that, in, in, in the secular world, right? Uh, here in the background, Marx and the socialists, right? If, they're, if you follow that line of reasoning that Christian love turns into socialism in the 19th century, socialists say then now the government should take care of this sort of stuff. Why? Because the government is us. It's humans taking care of humans. And yet, <laughs> unless there is a command Unless there's a command to love, maybe we grudgingly pay our taxes and cheat a little bit <laughs> and try not to pay because this is the worry. Humanism and atheism can devolve pretty quickly to self-interest, egoism, narcissism, take care of your own and don't care about anyone else. You know, it's a, you're right, I and mean, it's a huge, huge worry. Someone in there had your hand in the back. Yes. Let me, let me uh, intervene here with the word you just said. It's through process. So there are these people known as process theologians. And Paul Tillich is loosely associated with this school of thought, the process idea. Here's the basic gist of this. Instead of saying that God is love, which is a very substantive claim, God is love, oh, like as if it's just permanent, the process thought wants to say, God is the activity of loving. God is a verb, not a being. You know, God is creative power acting in the world. It's not the creator behind which we don't know what is, right? Uh, th this active process approach becomes huge in the 20th century. Uh, and one reason it becomes huge is it gets to, it, it, things turn into an either or. Either God is or God is not. Either God is loving or he is not. Either God is good or he is not. The process move allows God to be flexible, <laughs> allows God to be in process, right? And that may better, if we want to go with Feuerbach still, that we sort of have an anthropocentric approach to things, that probably better reflects our own experience. Because I'm not one thing, nor am I permanently anything. You know, I'm always on the move from moment to moment, from day to day. And if God's at all like me, he is that way too, probably. Um, yeah. Uh, I hope I didn't under misunderstand you, but I believe you just said that God could be a verb and not a noun. The process story says God may be a verb, not a noun. That's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> 
That, 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 that just, you know, that brings a lot of things into proper perspective for me. Yeah. Yay for verbs and bad for nothing. <laughs> uh, this, by the way, love too. Love, we turn it into a noun, but it's, it's probably an activity. You said this too, right? It's, a, it's something we do. And it's, I would use the word practice because I like this concept both from like music and sports, but also from religious practices. We do it again tomorrow because we've never gotten good at it yet. You know? And each day, I mean, if you play music, you do it, and man, it sounds pretty good, but tomorrow, I can't wait to do it again, you know? And it may be a little bit different tomorrow, maybe a little bit better, maybe worse, you know? And love is probably like that, some kind of a practice. Let me, let me just close, I, we're gonna, I know there's a couple other hands. I just wanna say something about Christmas. Uh, <laughs> we, didn't quite, we didn't quite make it all the way to Christmas, but then, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll stop here really quickly, and then if you have other thoughts or questions. Um, uh, the story is supposed to be this family drama that involves the active, creative process of God embodying himself into the world. The spirit become flesh, right? So the story involves all of this stuff about love, and we looked at, you know, there was that John 3.16 passage and the letter of John and so on. Um, when you look at these kind of images, look at the eye to eye, you know, the, what I find just wonderful about the story is that you can't, in order to get to love, in order to really think like God is love, you have to go through the human experience of it. I mean, if this was like God there, <laughs> love, you can't quite understand that. You know, you have to work your way through the human up towards the divine somehow, which is what Feuerbach was suggest suggesting we do inevitably. The Christmas story, though, has the reverse. You know, that's how we get up to God. But the story is about God descending to us, right? So the other side of this is that God embodies himself or personifies himself, becomes human so that he can suffer with us, for us, like us, and understand us so that he can love us better, right? And through that process, somehow we're supposed to understand and love God better. Right? It's an upward and a downward interchange. Now, I want to say one thing about Mary, because we started with Pope Francis. I'm going to skip up here. Yeah. Uh, there is some weird gender stuff going on here. God is the Father. God is the Son. And the Mother is a kind of receptacle and transmission device. You know? Um, if we had more time, we could look uh, a lot deeper into this kind of uh, gender, gender stuff. But the image of Mary, especially at Christmas time, is this image of the willing recipient of God's magical, mysterious, loving power, right? And especially when you look at that beautiful passage from Luke known as the Magnificat, where Mary says, my, let my soul magnify the Lord. Basically, she submits to God. From a gender standpoint, huh? <laughs> um, and I, I think somewhere in the slides there you see I have some other examples of gods taking advantage of young maidens, which happened in the Greek world. Zeus does this in a couple of places. Um, you know, it could be very critical of this, of this move. And yet, there is a kind of beauty to this idea of mother love that I think is inescapable if you've had a mother or been one or love one, <laughs> uh, there's just, there is something special and unique about it that I think that's interesting how that turns into the, the Christian story. So I got a whole bunch of other stuff here that we never got to, but let me um, reach my conclusion and then if you have any other things you want to talk about. So what I learned from this class, and thank you for allowing me to learn, <laughs> especially from your, your questions and you know, we're never quite there, it's all in process, but it seems to me that human beings benefit from and have a unique capacity to love. That we, we create love, and when we create love, we kind of create ourselves along the way, you know? And this idea that love is stronger than death, there's something to that. Uh, you know, when, when we create something in the world that we love, we do create a permanence. Maybe it doesn't last forever, but it lasts, it has some kind of endurance. Uh, we also benefit from thinking about love, so like this process that we're going through, 
That doesn't make you more loving. I don't know. <laughs> but it certainly helps you become a human being. You know, animals don't think. We think. Children don't think. Adults do. And so there's something important about thinking about love. And the Greek tradition tells us that wisdom is a kind of loving activity. And then these, these last two things, uh, celebrating and giving thanks for love. Um, if I, I think this is just true, you may disagree, but if we want there to be love in the world, we have to show it. You know, as you said, you have to, you have to give it. You have to acknowledge it. You have to say that it exists. You have to name it. You know, you have to affirm it. You have to celebrate and you have to thank people for it because too often love goes unnoticed. You know, it's in the corners of the room. There's your grandmother over there and she sustained the whole family through this whole crisis and no one even said thank you to her, you know. So um, celebrate love, give thanks for love. And then this last bit takes us back to ethics and Camus especially, again, and King. Camus and King kind of rivals today. Uh, there are people who lack love and what a tragedy. I mean, there, there's probably nothing worse. If you can imagine, there's nothing worse than a lonely life without love. And when we see that in the world, there's an obligation to do something about it. So, thank you. Oh, I have a Merry Christmas here. <laughs>